Uh, welcome everybody to the third installment of the Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Speaker Series. Uh, we're really excited uh, to have Fabiana Rodriguez here with us today. Uh, before we start talking and she uh, gives a presentation, I'm just going to hand it over to James Mann, the Dean of Arts and Humanities. James. Thank you, Dave. Um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, James Mann, Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities here at Lehman. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the third speaker in the Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Speaker Series, uh, a series that features some of the design industry's most significant and diverse voices with a focus on how design can impact social change. Uh, the series is generously supported by the Sarah Little Turnbull Foundation and is hosted by the Lehman College Art Gallery and the Department of Art at Lehman College. Uh, today, we are greatly honored to have Fabiana Rodriguez, who will be discussing gender and sexual identity in the world of design with our own David Schwittick, Professor of Art here at Lehman. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to take the time to announce, uh, especially for the students in our audience, the Sarah Little Turnbull Design Fellowship, uh, which, I've now put as my background, um, which offers grants and stipends of up to $1,500 to currently enrolled students for the purpose of developing a design related project that addresses well defined challenges in the, define, in the design field, or to cover the costs of taking part in a design related internship opportunity. Uh, you can apply for the grant or stipend by going to the website of the Lehman College Art Gallery, which is lehmangallery.org, uh, and clicking on the link there. And I encourage all students to apply. And that's what it actually looks like. Um, so we are absolutely delighted today and honored to have as our speaker, Fabiana Rodriguez, uh, actually technically inviting her back to Lehman since she has been to Lehman in the past. Uh, Fabiana Rodriguez is a visual artist and social ju justice activist based in Oakland, California, where she grew up. In her art and her activist practice, she addresses the topics of immigration, gender justice, racial equity, and sexual freedom. In her practice, she boldly reshapes the myths, stories, and cultural practices of the present while healing from the wounds of the past. Her work includes visual art, public art, writing, cultural organizing, and power building. She leads meaningful collaborations with social movements that lead to resilient and transformative cultural strategies. In addition to her extensive studio practice, she's the co-founder and president of the Center for Cultural Power, a national organization igniting change at the intersection of art, culture, and social justice. She's also been involved in setting up many cultural centers and design studios. She especially emphasizes the potential impact of design projects on the world and the importance of diversity of design to address the issues of gender and racial justice in a design culture that has systematically excluded the voice of people of color and especially women of color. She trained as a printmaker, which she holds is a more democratic medium for art and which has been used throughout history as a tool to expose the truth and fight for justice, as for example, in the political posters of the Black Panther movement. Fabiana is a recipient of numerous awards, including the Robert Rosenberg Artist as Activist Fellowship, the Atlantic Fellowship for Racial Equity, and the Soros Equality Fellowship. I'm delighted that she's returning to us, and I look forward to her talk today. Thank you so much, James. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, before we get into the, the, the talk, I just wanted to uh, say that we're open to uh, questions from, from all the audience. Uh, we're gonna hold the Q&A period until the very end, but feel free to ask questions at any point, then I'll just collect them and we'll kind of go through them at the end. Uh, Fabiana, I uh, you have a presentation to give us, but I, I wanted to just kind of start off by asking you uh, how you sort of got into design uh, to begin with. Can you talk about that a little bit? 
Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am joining you from Ohlone land, um, also known as Oakland, California. I'm really happy to be here. My pronouns are she and her. And um, I love talking to design students because uh, design was something that I um, sort of found uh, as a key way of expressing myself and, and sort of um, leaving a mark um, in, in this world in which I, I always felt highly invisible. So um, I'll give you the short version and I'll, when I'm presenting, I'll, I'll share a little bit more. I grew up um, in a neighborhood that was deeply impacted by the war on drugs in the 80s and 90s. And um, I always recognized that Latinos were just not presented in the culture around me. And uh, my father was Afro Latinx, uh, my grandmother. And so I lived in a mixed race household and I definitely did not see depictions of um, Afro Latinx around me. And so for me, making art was a way to um, make myself visible. And I always made a lot of art. And I, I, I learned actually how to make art through community art workshops, learning how to make screen prints, linoleum blocks. And at the time, because not everyone had a computer, I would use a Xerox machine to sort of compose things. And then the internet was born and it was my last year in high school. And I remember just hearing the sound of the modem. I don't even know if y'all know what that sounds like, but it was like a little dial in. And then I would just feel connected to another universe. And that's the year when I first learned desktop publishing. It was Adobe Photoshop 1.0 actually computers were only in like black and white mostly. Uh, and I was just fascinated that I could design something on my computer and that I could share it with the world. And so I taught myself how to code in 1999, um, right before the sort of big dot .com um, boom. And I think it was really important because I learned um, basic you know, web language but really, I think I just learned that you could find the tools to express yourself and uh, that you could learn yourself because you didn't have to go to school for it, right? Because they were not teaching design yet because design was like pretty new. Uh, and so I taught myself and I taught myself so well that um, I ended up actually starting my own web company. And that was really, you know, that's what opened me up and you'll see that a lot of my art is actually inspired by the blend of printmaking and technology. Great, great. Uh, yeah, so that's um, that's how you got into it. So tell us a little bit about what you've been working on during your career and, and how it sort of intersects with uh, activism. And Great, and then I can, can, should I go ahead and start my presentation? Yeah, go for it, yeah. yeah great. Yeah, because I'm a visual, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you all through a bunch of like um, concepts. And just so you know, I've designed all of my slides, meaning a lot of my slides are my own work. They are the way that I really want to um, express myself. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay. Great. Can everyone see a culture is power slide? Yes. Great. Great. Um, so for me, the, the, the sort of key idea that I always go back to is the idea that culture is power. And that is that what we create, what we see in the world around us is very powerful. It actually shapes our imagination. And so when I was growing up, there was no like cartoons with Latino characters. I mean, Dora the Explorer didn't exist yet. Um, Selena, the musician hadn't even been, you know, she, she hadn't really made it big yet. And so I didn't really have depictions that looked like me or dolls or anything. Like I just didn't, we were invisible except for maybe Speedy Gonzalez, which was a very, you know, kind of racist re representation of Latinos. And that really affected my perception of myself. Uh, I didn't really like who I was. I didn't understand how to, you know, do my hair. Um, I didn't really, I didn't really understand my culture or what we ate because um, all around me was predominantly white culture. And so um, it affected me and it affected my self-esteem until one day I saw a muralist in my community painting a mural. And this was also the era of the birth of hip hop, right? It was the eighties. 
And I was just like so blown away to see that somebody could make something on this big wall. And so um, when I think about the power of culture and design, I think about the ways in which it can expand our imagination, but also make us feel seen and make us feel visible. And um, I like to think about culture as the ocean that we swim in, right? Like we are literally swimming inside of culture. And if we think about design in particular, we are in a world, in a visual landscape that is constantly telling us how to think and it's shaping our ideas, right? So an example of that is, you know, when I was a teenager and I would just go to the grocery store with my parents, um, on the magazines, it was all white women. It was all white women on all the teen magazines. Um, and so I hardly saw myself and I didn't see um, any black people, hardly saw Asians, you know, Native Americans, forget it. And so um, I recognize that what we see, you know, what, we're, what we see around us also gives us a lot of information, right? The other thing that I saw growing up is I saw a lot of, a lot, I, I grew up in a food desert and I saw a lot of fast food. Uh, and I just would always wonder like, wow, why is there so many liquor stores and fast food in my neighborhood? Uh, and so I understand that I like to think about culture as an ocean because it shapes us and we can also shape it. Just like, you know, the Black Panthers. I grew up in Oakland, California, the home of the Black Panthers. So there was still remnants of black power and that shaped me as well. You know, seeing graffiti, I was like, whoa, what's that? Like, what are those big, bold colors top to bottom on the street that are just sort of a sign of resistance because I was growing up in a concrete jungle. This was the crack era. Like this was very, I, I, I wouldn't even really go outside um, to like take a walk or anything or like ride my bike because I lived in gang territory and drugs was devastating my community. I mean, I remember looking out of my window, I live in the same house that I grew up in um, and just seeing gang fights. And I had to actually, my parents had to work very hard to try to get me to a school where there wasn't a lot of gangs. And so I was always like, wow, my neighborhood is like really neglected. Even as a kid, I was like, why do we live like this? Like, why is there so much police brutality? Why is there so much gun violence, right? Like I'm 12 years old, like I shouldn't experience gunshots. And sometimes I would hear gunshots or people around me would be killed by guns, right? Because it was gang life. And um, that really affected me. And in the same way, I was also able to have a, a form of escape, which was art. And I'm so glad I had art because other people's form of escape was drugs or, you know, getting into gangs or, you know, doing things that were not legal at the time. And I don't blame people for that. I think, unfortunately, that's the environment we were growing up in. But for me, art allowed me to then create something else, create another reality for myself. And when I think about the role of culture, I guess I recognize that culture shapes politics and economics. Like, what we see and what is presented to us will actually shape laws. Because what also happened when I was a teenager is that you had the beginning of the anti-immigrant movement. So you had elected officials who were saying, all, you know, Latinos are illegals, get them out of here. They're taking your jobs. Here we are 20 years later and that rhetoric is still here. It started though, really like the contemporary anti-immigrant movement started in California in the 90s. And I saw how that shaped laws. And that's where I became very determined to make sure that I was creating a different kind of culture, especially in a different kind of visual culture that could reflect all the things that I cared about. Because I don't just care about being a Latinx woman. I also care about being a woman, uh, you know, like somebody who was born in this body that I have to experience a bunch of injustices. Um, I care about growing up in a community impacted by mass incarceration and the war on drugs. I'm a first generation American. So I grew up in a mixed status and mixed race family and all those things affect me. Uh, this is my uh, family that, that um, we, we all you know, grew up here. My, my brother and I grew up here in the United States but my parents and my grandparents were all uh, Peruvian. 
Uh, my father uh, was Afro-Peruvian and my parents didn't have a college education. They migrated here in 1968. And um, my father always would support my creativity. He would put my art up on walls. I feel like my home growing up was a gallery, like everywhere you looked, even the kitchen, I would have my art up and I would like literally design from top to bottom my, my home um, because that was my safe place. And it was a place for me to um, represent and to have a voice, right? To create, to create a different reality. And that's, I appreciate art so much for also being a place where we can um, really find ourselves, right? Because when you don't see yourself reflected and you're sort of being um, impacted by a system, it's so important that you, you process that in some way because it's a painful experience. And art was a way for me to do that. Luckily, I lived in a community in which um, there had been a Chicano rights movement. So there was a lot of workshops in my community for free, like mass making, Day of the Dead workshops. I learned how to screen print um, and really how to make things that I could easily reproduce and distribute. I want to show you the, my neighborhood I grew up in because that also impacted me. Um, I grew up in the Fruitvale. You know, the Fruitvale is where Oscar Grant was killed um, in 2009, I believe. I'm pretty sure it was 2009. And really, the, 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 the murder of Oscar Grant is the beginning of a social media era in which, um, in which people captured police violence on their phones. Because previous to that, you know, I remember seeing Rodney King getting yeah, Rodney King beatings in 1992, but then it was also like a lot of police brutality. We would see it through the media lens as opposed to the people's lens. And this is also another example of the power of culture, right? Is when you remove the um, sort of uh, central distribution, right? Which in this case, we were watching police brutality on TV. When you then give people the tools to show you from their perspective what they're seeing, that's game changer right there. That is a shift in culture because it actually led to a huge shift in culture, which we're still experiencing today. Um, so this is my hood surrounded by two freeways. As you can see, there's the 880, which is the, the freeway that's closer to the water. And then there's the 580, which is the freeway in the hills. So if you notice here, the freeway that's closest to the hills has the best air. Um, and, and the freeway that runs through my neighborhood has toxic air. I mean, you could see some of this is approaching, is, is over the 70% of toxins. Why is that? Um, it's because the neighbors in the hills uh, didn't want the toxic trucks driving through their neighborhood, so they banned them. And then guess who gets the um, unfair burden of all the dirty air? is communities of color. This is the situation for Lat Latinx, Asian, and Black communities is that we breathe dirtier air, which literally shortens our lifespan by 10 years. People in the flatlands live 10 years less than people in the hills. And um, when I was growing up, I would see a lot of asthma, and I would see a lot of diabetes and things that were affecting um, our bodies. And so I knew that we were, you know, that, that the environment was hurting us. But I didn't really understand what environmental justice was. Um, but this is one of the reasons why I am such an environmentalist is because I know that, you know, when people talk about climate change, climate change just doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen on its own. It requires for people to take oil out of the earth, usually in communities of color. And guess what? They have to burn them somewhere. Like they have to be, somebody's gonna be affected and that's communities of color. Overwhelmingly um, in this country, at least, and actually in, in, in the world, communities of color suffer the most from oil extraction. Uh, and, and so this shaped me uh, tremendously. Uh, and, and so when I, when I talk about what are the things that I make today, what are the things that I design, a lot of the things that I design are the things that I experience in my life because it's not about one thing. It's about all the intersections of things. Um, my inspiration came tremendously from the Black Panthers because I saw their imagery and stuff on the street. You all, you all, you, all, you, you see my image there of the Panthers, right? Great. Sometimes it gets stuck. Yeah. 
And so for me, it's design is about perspective. It's about what you're seeing that you can share with others. And unfortunately, the primary perspective we see today and I saw for years growing up is the perspective of white cisgender men. And when you only see the perspective through one lens, you're actually not seeing reality. You're seeing a distorted reality because we all have different perspectives and it's the composition of our perspectives that actually creates reality, right? Um, because, you know, I'm gonna experience the world through a very different lens. And so for me, uh, design is about really bringing your whole self into the process of creating and really honoring your perspective um, and allowing for your perspective to lead the way. One of the things that, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now move into really, um, what, what specifically my, my gender work and specifically, um, I, uh, I've been tremendously inspired by feminist movements, but I would say the one that most has inspired me um, has been the Me Too movement. And it's inspired me because it shows me the power of story. So, you know, today we're talking about the power of design and visual culture largely, but there's a power to the story as well. In reality, we have power in many ways. We have power with what we create with our hands and how we use our voice. And um, similar to the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, telling stories is important. We have to be able to talk about what we've experienced and, and tell those stories because in telling those stories, we can shift policies and we can help illuminate patterns that may not have been illuminated before. In this case, it's not that sexual harassment didn't exist. It's that we needed the stories to illuminate and to help us actually feel as a society, just how deeply, deeply embedded this is. You know, if you remember my slides, culture, politics, economics, uh, the political sector hasn't changed when it comes to Me Too. I mean, there is literally a Supreme Court um, justice and a president with massive, massive um, claims uh, and stories of sexual assault and harassment. Uh, but culture has changed. And it's changing and it's always going to be moving faster than politics. That's why I love being an artist is because what we make is actually the beginning of the normalization of an idea, right? And, and when an, an idea becomes a law, that means that, it, that the final manifestation of the, that idea has been codified, but we create the idea and we normalize the idea as artists. Uh, this is something that I always like to use for myself in my artistic practice, and that is that how is my art helping people take action, but also how is it spurring new ideas, right? Often when we're taking action, we are taking action um, to say no to something, right? So we're saying no to the climate crisis, no to police brutality, no to sexual abuse, but we also have to be about our yes. Like, what are we saying yes to? What are the big ideas that we want to embrace? And I always, as you know, an artist designer, I, I, I'm about the ideas. Uh, I want to depict the kind of world that I want to live in in the future, that I want um, people of all genders to thrive in. And so for me, the world of ideas is, is very important. This is some of my work. Uh, I have, my style has just evolved a lot over the years. I think that the main thing uh, that has really informed me though is um, making, com composing with, 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 with a, a, an intent to communicate power, right? Like I wanna show power. Um, and maybe it's because I didn't feel powerful growing up, but, but in my colors, in my use of lines, um, I'm communicating a sense of boldness. Um, and also, you know, as, a, as an artist who was trained, um, I was trained in, in, in what I would call mediums that, mediums that are about the people, right? The people's mediums. I was trained in screen printing, in Xerox. You know, I would make my Xerox flyers for all my marches cutting little things out and then sizing them and then gluing them. Uh, I always learned that things, the power of the black line, 
that the black line brought things all together. And so you'll see that a lot in my work. Um, so a kind of key moment for me was coming out about my abortion in 2012. And um, I came out because, first of all, I had an abortion when I was 21 years old, when I was in college. And, you know, growing up in a uh, Latinx family, my parents never talked to me about sex. On the contrary, a lot of the messages that I got were, um, keep your legs closed, don't get pregnant, don't, you know, don't let anyone touch you very pain oriented messages, right? I didn't have joy oriented messages. I didn't have any messages that really um, gave me agency or just taught me about how do you have sex in a way where you, um, you know, you, you're communicating and you, you're, you're getting your needs met, but you're also able to communicate your yes and your no. Uh, so unfortunately I was not able to communicate what I didn't want, and I ended up getting pregnant when I was 21 years old, my third year, and I had an abortion um, by myself. It was a very scary moment, and um, my partner at the time just kind of like disappeared, was not supportive, which kind of goes to show you like what kind of partners I was choosing, and that is all related to the fact that I just did not have anyone showing me about how to have healthy relationships, so I had unhealthy relationships, one of them ending ending up in, um, in 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 a pregnancy. So, what I thought about at that time, um, well, first it took me ten years to come out about it, right? Uh, two thousand one to twenty twelve, eleven years, and for me it was a turning point because I realized, you know, in the same way that I was talking about the Me Too stuff, is that telling our stories is so important, like communicating our stories and what we've experienced is a big part of, of my design process is that I am going to talk about openly the things, the, the things instead of, instead of feeling shame, I'm going to use art to be very bold in my thinking. And that's when I started creating this kind of stuff. And this was a turning point for me because it really um, kind of, I, I sort of, kind of came out of the closet about a lot of things. Uh, first is that, you know, I was slut shamed all throughout high school. And I even was in a book about like how slut shaming really affects people. But then I was just like thinking to myself, um, you know what, I like, I'm gonna embrace my sexuality. Like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna like play with that definition because, um, all my life, well, all of my early teenage life up until the time I was 20 has been defined by me being small and not owning my sexuality and on the contrary, allowing others to define it, but also, um, you know, just kind of being quiet when the state tries to mess with my rights, right? Because, you know, we can talk about abortion, but when you talk about abortion, also people there's a lot of abortion that happens in this country. You know, one, one, one in three women have an abortion before they're 40. And um, of course, it's, it's not just women who have abortions, people of all genders have abortions, but the data um, is uh, that, that counts women indicates that one in three, one, that's a lot. And yet the policies, it's just like, I'm just like, wow, how do all of these like, men in office like decide policies that is affecting so many people, it's ridiculous. So I just became more bold in my work and um, wanted to, my work was a way to break my silence and to actually say, there's no shame in having an abortion. There's no shame in being sexually active. There's no shame in self-pleasure. We actually have to break that conversation open because it's actually hurting people. You know, not only is it leading to unwanted pregnancies. I mean, if you look at unwanted pregnancies in the Latino community, and I think similarly in the Asian community, you can actually trace that a lot of the reasons people get pregnant is because of lack of information and lack of knowing how to be sexual, right? Like how to actually exert your sexual rights, which means that 
it's not just about consent. It's about being able to say, hey, I actually only want to have sex for joy, not to reproduce. And therefore, let's use these things, X, Y, Z, right? Um, around this time, I also came out as queer. Uh, it just was a moment for me to kind of tell my story because up until then, from 2000 to about 2012, I was definitely making art, but it was always about politics, right? It wasn't about my personal story. It was about, you know, the war, right? Because remember, we were in a war. Um, it was about gentrification, racial justice. And then I just realized that like, I can't go on making art without actually sharing my perspective on why these things, I can't just say, be pro-choice. Like, I, I actually should talk about my experience because that makes it so much more powerful. Uh, and also, you know, in that, I believe that, um, I believe we carry our ancestral trauma in our bodies. And, you know, when I think about um, as a womb carrier, when I think about what has happened in my family, um, I, there's a lot of womb trauma. So my mom, when she first migrated to the United States, um, she was in an abusive relationship and she tried to get help and the church, uh, she was pregnant and the church uh, really encouraged her to give up her child. And my mom did, she gave her child for adoption. Um, and we didn't know that she had a child for 31 years. I didn't know I had an older brother for 31 years until he found us. And so I recognize my mom had womb trauma. My grandmother has womb trauma from sexual assault. And so I just, uh, for me, my the, the, the work that I make is about healing from that, but also naming that, depicting that. So it's not just about, and it's not just about my pain, it's also about my joy, as you can see here. Um, in this piece, I am talking about um, having, you know, an orgasm, but also blood, right? Because I, like like many folks, uh, I also grew up in a culture that just didn't like blood, didn't like menstruation, right? Like I had to really um, hide my blood from my family in the sense where, you know, it was always about like that I would be moody or, or this idea that, you know, when you bleed, you have to sort of just, kind of be on the down low and, 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 and that it's, it's, it's a sort of hidden thing or it's a gross thing. And so all of those things I'm unlearning and I purposefully put them in my art in order to uh, destigmatize them. Uh, you'll also notice, you know, for somebody like, you know, I, I, I grew up without computers. I learned how to make art with my hands. When I started using computers from 2000 to 2010, I, I mastered it. Like I can, I, I, I could, I can do anything on a computer, but I got tired of looking at a screen for my art and for have, and for work. So a lot of what you see here is all what I would call analog, right? It's basically me cutting paper and gluing it. However, I draw my concepts first on my, my, my pad, my procreate pad, and then I print out my designs and then I use those as a guide for cutting my paper. So I go from digital to analog to digital. I just go back and forth, uh, but I really love the feeling of carving, of gluing, of putting things together. Uh, this is a, another one of my pieces, Rise Up for Justice, uh, Down with Machismo. Uh, and then I also just, you know, many times I am, because I'm working in social movements, I have to get work out fast. And um, in that case, what I do is I make a lot of my textures in analog form, um, and then I import them over to my design program, and I just, I mess with them. So I, I really love this going from digital to analog to digital analog because um, it helps me you know, working with your hands is so important and actually starting with your hands, starting in the physical realm is important before going over to the digital realm. Uh, and so I always, I, I try to start analog, go digital and then go back and forth. This piece is a linoleum block with screen printed words on it. Uh, this piece, women pay the price for the decisions by men. 
you know, just like these are stats from 2010, but they're still very applicable, uh, which is of the 50 million displaced, 80% are women and children. Um, sex trafficking is one of the highest grossing industries worldwide. The exploitation of, um, of bodies for sex trafficking is a huge, huge industry that is largely uh, ignored. Um, and then, you know, the hungriest people in the world are women. The poorest people in the world are women. And this is not by coincidence. This is by design. And so, you know, as a, as a feminist, I'm very explicit in my work um, against, uh, you know, naming that patriarchy is a system that has to go. And as I shared before, just that I view my work as healing for not just myself, but for past generations. This is a collage uh, that I did as a sort of um, honoring also my Peruvian culture. In, in Peruvian culture, there's a lot of uh, fabrics that are very much from the Inca style that are these patterned fabrics. And so I was attempting to recreate the, a, a sort of uh, story through the, the patterns. And, you know, just that this is healing work. I think for me, the work around sexuality and gender justice is really healing work because gender violence is uh, generational. It has happened to many, many generations. When we need to um, come to terms with what has happened, I mean, especially, you know, like my um, ancestors uh, experienced a lot of rape and sexual assault. I mean, that is the, the history of, of Latinx people is that you had uh, massive colonialism. There was slavery happened, 95% of slavery happened in Latin America, 5% of it in the US, but the rest was in Latin America. Uh, and just, you know, for me, it's a real, it's a real process of healing uh, because it's not just about naming where we want to go. We also have to reconcile with what has happened to um, our ancestors who may not have had the tools to, uh, you know, deal with, 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 with some of what was, um, you know, just the tools to, to process. Um, this piece, Migration is Beautiful, is one of my most popular pieces, and it is really a call for um, us recognizing that we are all nature and nature moves. We have been moving since the beginning of time. Human beings always move. We are migratory species, just like birds. Uh, and we've been moving since the beginning of time. And so it's, it's unfortunate that we live in a world in which the movement of people is criminalized, even though uh, the, the Western colonial powers like ravage, they ravage the world. The reason we have migration is because the colonial powers stole, 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 stole resources that affect us to this day. As, as I was sharing with you um, in an earlier slide, I grew up in a food desert. So for me, food justice is very important. Um, Latinx workers are the main ones who are working in slaughterhouses, the meat industry, which is also, you know, creating havoc in the Amazon. So I'm a vegan and I a lot of the art I do is about um, being plant-based, uh, being a woman of color who's plant-based and how, you know, a lot of our cultures were plant-based. We didn't eat, we, we, we didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't destroy the animal kingdom the way we do now in our, in our ancestral traditions. These are more of my um, collages. And I, you know, this one in particular, Ecofem is really, you know, representative of my Inter intersection of um, ecology and feminism, right? This is a term that Judy Berry would talk about and really just say that environmental devastation is the result of patriarchy because um, men treat the planet the way they treat women, the way they exploit um, other races is the extraction of everything we can make in, in, in the service of a, a greedy few. So for me, my environmentalism is about uh, really protecting life. And I, this is, this is really, for me, this is like also involved with, uh, with, with my work um, around uh, 
protecting the right to choose because I do think that when we're talking about protecting life, you know, I'm talking about protecting oceans, protecting forests, protecting um, uh, the animal kingdom, um, protecting also people, humans, right? And also knowing that um, we are able to give life. And that also is like a huge responsibility that that needs deep, deep decision-making. And, and, and that, you know, throughout our cultures, throughout history, there was abilities for us to, um, you know, to terminate pregnancies when, when we needed to. So I try to connect all the dots on, in my work. Uh, this is a piece I did for the People's Climate March. I, um, my, my, my goal as an artist is to, is to do intersectional stories. I'm gonna zoom past some of the um, recent, I'm gonna just, I wanna make sure we have time for questions. This is some of my most recent pieces that I've been doing for uh, around voting. So this piece, you know, these, these works, I design on my computer, I cut them out in linoleum block and then I print them or I screen print them. This is a digital, uh, digital piece. Uh, this is also a digital piece, you know, talking about voting for Mother Earth, uh, voting early. This year, of course, it's not enough to say vote. Uh, you have to say how to vote because we have very different ways of voting. Um, and then finally, this one, uh, which, you know, I, I just, when, for me also, it's so important to uh, design in a way that responds to the moment, right? So when we hit 210,000 dead from COVID, it was also, um, I think, around the time when um, new news came out about Breonna Taylor's death. I really felt that it was important to talk about the dead. Um, and so, you know, when I, a lot of times I'll just have these ideas and I have maybe a couple hours. So I'll just make my design in Procreate, get it ready, send it to my team, and then we'll make screen prints, right? Well, next thing you know, we have a hundred of these as screen prints. And so, um, and I have something digital, but for me, it's such an important to have an object, you know, to make something with my design, to make something with my hands that I could distribute because I feel like that is, you know, to have an object means that it exists in the world and that, you know, 20, 30 years from now, I have a record of, of, of what I made. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and open it up to questions. Thank you so much. Uh... That was that was uh, amazing, as always. I just I have a couple of questions uh, personally from you. Um, I I'm just I'm just want to say though first I'm really in awe of your of your work and have been for years. I've been like following you, um, and you've just been in, like this this amazing rise in what you're doing. And I I, I take a lot of inspiration from what you do. Um, that being said, I myself am a, a, a cis white male designer. And I, you know, one of the reasons I invited you here and really organized this entire lecture series is because I have a lot of anxiety about, you know, I don't consider myself a, a credible messenger when it comes to issues of gender and, and, and um, Latinx uh, representation, gender representation, LGBTQ plus representation, what have you in the world of design or any world for that matter, because of who I am. So my, I guess my question would be to you, uh, how does a designer of any sort of, in, wherever they lie in the intersection of these things, serve, best serve as an ally to these movements yeah. that are happening now? Yeah. Um, I think first is to recognize that we all have privilege right? Like I am an American citizen. I have more privilege than undocumented people. Right. I am an able-bodied um, person and I have um, more privilege than somebody who's disabled. Uh, I'm cisgender. I can, you know, I have more privilege than people who are trans or non-binary and, in, 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 you know, in our culture today. So I think it's always important to take an assessment of privileges and to um, open doors for people without those privileges and be very deliberate about it, right? And so in my work, I have um, 
always supported undocumented content creators um, in my organization. We very much partner with non-binary and transgender artists. And um, I very much recognize that it's, it's actually about supporting people over the long term, right? Which is like mentoring, making space for them. And, you know, I'm now, I find myself now in a position of power where I can really push, right? I think people have to really, really push. I, any chance I get, if I'm on, you know, a panel of all artists, and I'm the only woman, I'll say, why am I the only woman here? Or I'll say like, how did you guys decide this panel? Or I'll say, you know, why are there no black artists on this panel? You know, where, you know, or if we're, you know, we're talking about, if you know, if we're talking, having a panel on gender, I'll be like, we cannot have a panel of all cis people. That's just not okay anymore. Right. So um, I think it's important to always be in, um, practice allyship from whatever perspective you are able to uh, after, you know, you, you, you take an assessment of, of where that is, because it, right. it, happens, it can, you know, even in this, in this, you know, today I, I have a home, I'm in, in, in a region where there's uh, many, many houseless people and I um, weave it into my work. Right, so I am constantly trying to see where there are uh, other opportunities I can open up for people um and uh yeah just like learn you know show up and learn and and understand uh you know i didn't i didn't um understand too much around how disability showed up in the entertainment space right and i realized i was like wow hollywood is so freaking ableist and so now that i work with people in the entertainment industry i'm very deliberate to make sure we have asl translators you know you know just i'm, I'm deliberate in that yeah yeah. In fact, one of the, th it's interesting you mentioned that one of the things that we wanted to do for this, for this series is because it's about inclusion and diversity is to include people that can't hear, right? They, they, they're unable to, to listen. And then of course, of course people can read lips, but it's a, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's a less than uh, conceit. So we were looking at options for Zoom, like how do you use Zoom and how can you do captioning? And it was extremely com com complicated and arduous and couldn't ultimately work for a few different reasons. So that was just like one issue we were trying yeah. to tackle while doing this. And it's just like, there's the software, Silicon Valley is not there yet. You know, yeah. it's like, um, I have another question here. Um, artists are often described as predicting the future. However, I think most of us live in the past while artists are bold enough to look carefully and critically at the present and share with us what they see. My question, Fabiana, you have also leveraged design tools and strategies to communicate. Do you feel a tension between presenting yourself as an artist or a designer? For you, is there a distinction? Yeah. So um, no, I, I don't. I don't. I don't feel a tension. I used to when I try to keep things separate because for for years, for ten years, I had a design firm. And uh, so I was a, I was, I was a designer for hire. Um, I'm no longer that because I was like, wow, I'm giving, I like all my best ideas are going to clients. And I just, you know, I'm not an idea factory either. Uh, so I decided to stop. Um, um, I decided to, to more like just focus on my own design work and like really think about um, how different uh, forms affect different people. So I am now doing short films. I think that social media is its own kind of requires its own design, yep. um, mobile uh, stuff. So I don't, um, it's not a distinction. However, I do think it becomes a distinction when I'm collaborating with clients because if I wanna show up as an artist, often I need more spaciousness for my ideas. Whereas with design, it is really about an interaction with another, it, it's about collaboration. It's about also identifying, it just, your set of how you measure success is different than how you would measure success through art, right? Uh, and and you just, I just, I, I'm, I'm aware of that. And I think it's an important distinction because when I'm working on a design project to help end the climate crisis, 
Like it needs to help end the climate crisis, period. The way I assess it and how I determine that is a different set of questions than me just making art about the climate crisis. So yeah. Yeah, uh, I have like a follow-up to that. Do you, what do you think about the gallery system? I mean, I know it's different on the West Coast, but are you represented by a gallery? No. Yeah, I'm it. not. I'm not. And I and I I actually have never been approached by that, that, which just tells you, you guys, racism in the art sector is so bad. It is yeah. so bad. Like I am a artist who works with like major companies. I work with Ben and Jerry's. I get public art projects all the time. Like I'm an established artist. I oh thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm hungry I, now. <laughs> yeah. I, I like, you know, I think that. Today, as a Latina artist, I probably am one of the most known Latina artists, which is kind of sad because I bet you, you can't probably name even five Latina artists. Like, you know, it's hard. Um, so even despite that, like I don't, and nor have I ever been approached for gallery representation and I sell a lot of work, but it just tells me that the gallery system is like off somewhere else. They're just not they're not looking in the right places. If they're not finding me, they're not finding a lot of people. Uh, and so I have always believed in creating my own pathway. I'm not gonna wait until for somebody to say that my work is good enough. I'm going to find my audience. And that's, what I've, that's how I've always thought. I'm really grateful to have grown up in the Bay Area where people here are entrepreneurs. I see myself as an artist, designer, entrepreneur. Um, and I'm going to make my own path. And I, I have done that, been very committed to that. And, it, and now, now that we're in the age of COVID and you know, these galleries are really affected, mm. I've actually been selling more art this year than I ever have in previous years. And that's because my fans really show up for me. So I didn't have to close my studio. I was able to keep going. And I'm so glad because you know what? It's not like a gallery is gonna come save me. Right. Um, so I just think it's important for people to take ownership of their IP and, and of their whatever, you know, destiny they want. I have another question here that is, I guess, kind of related to intellectual property in some ways. Uh, the question is, do you, I mean, well, the, the intro would be that you have a lot of, your work is like very information based. You're conveying a lot of information um, and communicating it. Do you use archives to make your designs? I notice many references to statistics and generally in the way you present your, your projects. Yeah, so um, I would say I use a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I am an information, yes. I like gather and compile. Um, so whenever, you know, I have like my Instagram saves, I read a lot of news and I'm like, ooh, I like that sentence. I like that fact and figure. Um, how do I take these facts and figures and combine them into one narrative, right? Um, and, and, and I think that's my role as a designer is that I get information and I try to create a new kind of story. So I, I yes, I, I, I um, save a lot of information, but then I decide how to interpret that. And that is, um, yeah, that's my, that's, yeah. That, that's, my, that's my lens on it. Uh, and um, I would say I no longer use archives. In the past, I would be like, oh, let me find a royalty-free image of the Black Panthers and we can, I can make a poster out of it. But I don't anymore just because um, it's just so hard to get permissions. So I just, I just always just try to make my own. You know, I, I get inspired by it, but then I try to remix it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you... Do you consider yourself an influencer? I know that's a dirty yes. word, but. No, no, I do, <laughs> okay. I do. Um, I, I, yes, I'm an influencer because I can help shape, uh, I have a lot of influence, now I do. Yeah. I, it's yeah. like, I have to own it. Uh, I have a lot of influence with my organization, with my social media account. And so I very much think about what I'm gonna post, like I'm like, how am I going to talk about like today? I'm going to make a voting video. So I have my 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 Biden Harris shirt. Nice. Um, I'm going to make a video about all the things I care about as a California voter, um, and you know just kind of de demystify the whole process. Uh, and so yes, I I take that responsibility very seriously, um, and I you know I I spread the word on all the things I care about. 
Uh, I, I have uh, one more question and it's kind of a weighty one. So you can, you know, you can answer it how you feel, but it's about policy design. Uh, we, we both agree that culture is, it's, it's really like, as you said, we're swimming in it. It's part of the environment we're in. And it's really one of the reasons that we've survived as a species, species right? It's how we learn, it's how we evolve. It has, it actually has effects on our evolution, on our genetic evolution, right? It's, of course, been, yeah. it's, been, it's been documented, right? So I want to talk about design's role in culture. Um, you mentioned, you know, where you live or where you grew up is in between two giant freeways and the freeway by you, you know, has trucks on it. The other one, the communities, they're banded together, the band trucks, which is a policy change, right? Climate change, for example, you know, I think since like the 90s, we've been told that climate change begins at home, right? It's like, you know, recycling and, and not using plastic yeah. straws. And, and it's, it, in other words, it's the individual's responsibility, right? But yeah. the fact is, is that this problem is a global human problem and it requires governments, massive scales to, to change the Absolutely. policy. So my question is, um, and like you said, culture shapes laws. And, and I actually consider laws to be a part of our culture, right? And they, they, it shapes us. And in fact, RGB believe this as well, right? That you change the, the culture with law. What, as designers, like what can we do to influence policy or even help design that policy? Yeah, you, um, we have to tell the stories of who's impacted by that policy. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about climate change, we can't talk about rising sea levels. You have to talk about the kids who are breathing the dirty air. You have to talk about Flint. You have to talk about, yep. you have to tell the stories of those affected. As human beings, we want to hear human stories. Right. And so, you know, when we're talking about, um, you know, like the impacts of Trump's immigration policy, we have to show the stories of immigrants. Who are these, you know, how are the parents affected? I mean, these kids in cages are gonna be facing lifelong trauma. So I would say, do your research, but also show, show, from, show from the perspective, but also show a solution. I think that it's not enough to talk about the problem. Right. propose a solution and the solutions are there you know if we want to talk about climate change we have green new deal there is so much you can do with green new deal right we can talk about moving off of fossil fuels um there is there's i i always encourage people to provide a solution in your design because otherwise we're already we're lingering in the pain as opposed to moving from the pain to the solutions. Mm. And I always think that those closest to the pain are closest to the solutions. So this is why I said, get the stories of those who are impacted and find a way to depict them. Um, and then finally, I would say is that you policy is completely shaped by culture. Yeah. It is like it it it's like the more you can normalize an idea, that idea will eventually become normal. And so it'll be codified. Yep. But for many times that idea may not be normal. So imagine 10 years ago, we were not using gender pronouns. Right. And now it's normal, right? Things can be normalized, um, but it's about kind of um, showing that concept in as many representations as possible. Well, Fabiana, thank you so much. I just want to say again, it's, it's really an honor it's like that, a high point of my my year, my year to speak to you. I know that's not saying much because it's been a terrible year, but <laughs> this is like the high point of my year so far. You're one of my heroes. So thank you so much for meeting with us today. I, I know, you know, you've been an inspiration to me for the last over a decade now. I know you are to our students. So thank you again for meeting with us. And um, yeah, uh, I appreciate it. I, I gave everybody your Instagram uh, account information so they can follow you. Your shop is up here, yeah. Okay. Great, great, great. Um, yeah, we'll eat ice cream. Uh, yes. I promise. Yeah. I promise. Uh, thank you again. And uh, thanks to everybody for coming and uh, James Mayen for introducing the talk. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, we will be posting this up on the gallery website uh, pretty soon, a couple days. So thanks okay. again, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.